Our next panel is Asia Pacific, Regional Perspectives on Services. Please welcome our moderator, Sir Tom, Thomas Harris, the Vice Chairman of Standard Chartered Bank, who will be joined by our distinguished panelists. Charles Lake, President, Aflac International Incorporated, and Chairman and Representative Aflac Japan. His Excellency, Juan Gabriel Valdez, Chilean, Chilean Ambassador to the United States. Ed Keneally, Senior Vice President, General Counsel, Liberty International, Liberty Mutual Insurance Group. And David Dollar, Senior Fellow, John L. Thornton China Center of the Brookings Institution. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, um, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, Chairman of the European Services Forum, but as you've heard, I work for a bank, Standard Chartered, which is a British bank, but actually its first ever branch was in Calcutta in 1858. So we've been in Asia for well over 150 years. We're in every significant uh, Asian market, and the bulk of our revenues and profits are, are generated in uh, Asia. So the Asia-Pacific region is of enormous importance to my company, I want to kick off the discussion before I invite this very distinguished panel to, to give us their presentations by making just four very simple points about the subject we're going to be talking about. First of all, unlike Europe or North America, Asia Pacific is not a single homogenous economic block. Um, the Asia Pacific region covers a wide variety of different sorts of economy. Vietnam has a per capita income of $5,000. Japan has a per capita income of $37,000. India has a per capita income of $5,350. Singapore, believe it or not, has a per capita income of $76,000. So these are very, very different countries. Um, and there's another, if we're looking to the future, there's another very significant um, difference within this region, and that's demographic. As a simplification, the countries of East Asia, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, China, over the next 20 years face a growing problem of an aging population. And in some cases, a workforce which is already um, declining. Conversely, uh, in South Asia, countries like India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, they have what they call a demographic dividend. They are on the verge of an explosion in their working age population. So that's the first point I want to make, is that the, 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 this Asia-Pacific title covers very different sorts of uh, economy. And one of the merits of this panel is that we have got a wealth of specialist knowledge, um, and I'm going to invite uh, the panelists to talk from their different um, geographical perspectives about some of the developments. The second point is equally obvious, but it's worth reiterating. This is where the growth is. Every set of economic forecasts I have seen over the last few years projects that something like two-thirds of global economic growth over the next 20 years will be in the Asia-Pacific region. Even as the growth rate in China moderates, as it will do, as it did in Japan, as it did in Korea, even as it moderates, even as the Indian growth rate moderates, we will still see the bulk of economic growth in the global economy coming from this region. The third point I want to make is that for services, what's significant is um, not just the forecasts of GDP growth. For services, there's a correlation between increases in per capita income and demand for services, which is exponential. So for a, any given GDP growth, um, you will have a growth in demand for services that significantly exceeds that. Why? It's because, again, to um, oversimplify, Asia-Pacific is still an area which is 
underprovided with services. I mean, for example, only a fifth of adults in Bangladesh, Vietnam, or Thailand have a bank account. If you take the whole of the Asia Pacific region, excluding uh, Japan, only half of all the adults uh, have a, a, a bank account. And we know that relatively modest increases, particularly when per capita incomes start exceeding $5,000 ahead lead to dramatic double-digit increases. You've heard it earlier today from the insurance sector, but it's exactly the same is true for the banking sector and, and I suspect, for all the sectors that you're, you uh, represent. The fourth and final point I want to make is that the emergence of mature services markets in Asia is going to be a very different phenomenon from what we saw in Europe or North America. And that is because it is coinciding with this technological revolution that previous panels uh, have touched on. At the end of last year, there were 780 million smartphones in Asia Pacific. Um, by 2018, that number is forecast to reach 2 billion, so half the region's population will have access to fast internet services. Um, McKinsey's recently did a report which predicted that in my industry, digital banking customers in Asia will rise to 1.7 billion by 2020. That is a phenomenal increase. That presents amazing opportunities but also astonishing threats to established service providers who could very easily be disintermediated in this process. So this is not a, a guaranteed success. And as the, those of you who listened to the previous panel, um, I was very struck by the, the panel of women who said the thing that makes them lie awake at night is the competitive challenge that arises from technology. So that's by way of broad um, background. I want to start off by um, inviting Ed Keneally from Liberty Mutual, a company that's had a great deal of experience of trying to break into uh, Asian markets, just to paint a broad brush picture of your experiences as a company in this uh, sure. region. Ed. Be glad to. Uh, first, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, just a little bit of background on Liberty Mutual Insurance. We're currently the third largest property and casualty insurance company in the United States and the sixth largest PNC insurance provider in the world. Um, as is the case for many other services companies, international expansion is certainly key to our long-term growth. We're currently in 30 markets globally, and over half of our company's revenue growth comes from outside the United States. I support Liberty International. That's our business unit that's focused on local in-country operations. Um, and we provide predominantly personal and small to medium enterprise commercial insurance in developing markets around the world. In addition to our operations in Europe, we also have a strong presence in these two regions. Uh, we're in Chile, Colombia, and Ecuador in Latin America, number three insurance company in Chile. Uh, and in Singapore, Vietnam, India, and Malaysia, and China in Asia. What I'm going to try to do today is try to is provide a bit of a view from the ground, some of the things that we encounter um, as a company as we enter these markets, um, and some of the things that leave my clients scratching their collective heads, some of the challenges that, that we approach. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, I don't practice in trade as much, but part of what my job is to do is to try to translate some of what a lot of this peop the people in this room do. Um, and make it, make it work as we look at a, at a new market. I'm going to focus my comments today on three areas. One is data flows, which we've heard a lot about, uh, FDI limitations, and regulatory transparency. So I'll start by offering at least one PNC insurer's perspective on uh, the ability to engage in cross-border data flows. We're currently engaging in a process where we're uh, consolidating our data management centers to, th to three data centers globally with a backup and data, um, backup and disaster recovery center in, here in the US. And we're doing that for a number of reasons, which, which probably aren't very <coughs> different from some of the reasons uh, we've heard from, from other panelists. 
Centralization improves efficiency, performance, and overall security. We can reduce redundancy through centralization by giving um, our in-country operations faster processing times and access to state-of-the-art data centers that also are, happen to be located in environments that don't flood or shake. Um, second, the business of insurance is about risk analysis. It's about customer service, but at back end, it's really about risk analysis, which means we, we crunch a whole lot of data. Processing data globally is essential to the success of our operations, and with the advent of you know, greater use of big data in our business and um, technological tools that allow for um, uh, the collection of, of consumer data, smart cars, um, in, uh, and, and telematics devices, the ability to crunch that data globally and our need for server capacity is only going to grow. Finally, centralization really supports our growth aspirations. It's far easier for us to migrate a new acquisition to a central data center than try to replicate what we feel is a Liberty Standard data center uh, locally. However, moving to a centralized data uh, environment has been, has been complicated due to a number of legal barriers. And I should point out that even though this panel is not focused on Europe um, or the EU, it's important to keep in mind that because we're in the business of insurance, the, uh, the FTC safe har harbor framework doesn't apply to our transfer of uh, customer and claimant related data. Uh, but turning to, to this region that, that we're talking about, just a, a few examples. Um, in India, a regulator doesn't allow us to transfer insurance related data outside of the country. And other countries may allow transfers, but then uh, impose sort of hurdles that sort of the Lord giveth on one hand and then taketh away on the other. You know, for example, China will allow um, transfer of data with, with consent. However, as a PNC carrier, we have a whole class of, you know, people that I term or cus customers that I term involuntary customers, and those are claimants third-party claimants specifically, with whom we may have no relationship until a claim occurs and actually have no incentive to provide us any um, uh, consent to transfer their data. In, in fact, depending on how litigious they are and having grown up as a litigator, they may have a disincentive to provide us a, a consent to transfer their, their data. And certain other countries may allow um, transfer of their data, but then um, want to make sure that it's to a, a jurisdiction that's deemed to have um, adequate uh, data uh, protection laws and data protection principles. I know Chile is considering a law that, that may have those sort of, sort of restrictions. And for that, that tends not, not to work for us as a, as a US-based uh, company because of um, our approach to privacy protection here in the US. Um, and there are relatively new data protection acts in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, how those acts will apply to our particular business, specifically, you know, the third-party claimant data that I, that I referenced, uh, still remain to, to be worked out from, from our perspective. You know, we're a global company. We certainly uh, give um, uh, great, uh, great credence to the consumer protection objectives underpinning the data protection laws, uh, but we also believe that the, you know, those sorts of consumer protection needs can be, can be met um, in, a, in a, a way that's not unduly restrictive. So we're hoping that trade agreements as they're negotiated uh, allow things like model clauses globally, uh, recognize multiple um, avenues for data transfer, and also in certain cases um, allow transfer among, among affiliates, certainly with respect to HR related data and, um, and uh, our, our data, our data center um, projects. You know, the the second item is um, for us is you know we're a relatively acquisitive organization. We've entered seven new markets in the past three years. Uh, when we look at new markets, I think one of, we've talked a lot about T's today. You know, we evaluate the market trajectory. Uh, we look at available talent, um, and the last would be treatment. Of, of, foreign, um, of foreign players in the market. So an issue we face is being able to enter new markets with 100% uh, ownership, which is our, our clear preference as an organization. We tend to be a strategic rather than a financial in investor in markets. Um, specifically, this has been an issue for us in India and Malaysia. Um, India, as you know, has a, or may know, has a 26% um, cap on uh, foreign direct investment in property and casualty insurance. Malaysia maintains a 70% ownership cap. 
Um, but Malaysia also has a mandatory tender offer requirement. So a controlling company may end up having to launch a tender offer for the remaining shares that leave it holding shares well in excess of the permitted cap. Um, so we're hopeful that some of these limits will be uh, lifted. You know, um, <laughs> Prime Minister Modi has said that he'll, uh, that he proposes and, and supports uh, raising the FDI limit to 49% in, in, uh, in the PNC um, uh, area and that uh, the Malaysia restriction will, will disappear under TPP. And, and finally, I guess I'd like to talk about regulatory transparency. Insurance is, as many of you know, I mean, pe many people here operated in a regulate, heavily regulated industry. Insurance is a regulated industry. Um, so the regulatory process is very, very important for us. Uh, the good news is that many regulatory regimes do provide a fair degree of regulatory predictability and transparency. Vietnam, another country in which we operate, has an inclusive regulatory process that includes notice and comment and opportunity for regulatory appeals. Insurers can apply for nationwide licenses in Vietnam. That's not true in every country where we operate. So the key is taking some of these regulatory best practices and making them global. Um, one area where we'd like to see additional work um, would be helpful in addressing the, the uneven enforcement of regulations. You know, a constant refrain I get from my local operations is, well, there's a sort of market conduct type regulation. We frequently, as a foreign player, are treated one way, and the local operations are, are treated number, an, another. So those are three issues that we deal with as we enter these in markets and evaluate the markets. And thank you for the opportunity. Well, Ed, I, that, that was a fascinating account. And I'm glad Ed gave it, because although he was talking on, from the point of view of Liberty Mutual, how many of us in the audience who've had experience will recognize those problems in our sectors? And I, I just want to emphasize on his first point about data transfers. There has been a tendency in the past to think the data transfer problem is a, um, a, a telecoms issue, or an internet, it's, it's a Google, it's an IBM, it's a Microsoft problem. It's not. As Ed's account made absolutely clear, it's fundamental to all of us trying to operate in international services. So, you know, we need to keep up the pressure on the negotiators to do something about it. But then I, I promised you that we would now start, start focusing on particular parts of Asia Pacific. And our next speaker, Charles Lake, who's president of AFLAC International and is a guru of all things Japanese, is going to give us a presentation on um, prospects for trade liberalization in Japan. Charles. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to uh, give a view uh, on Japan in the context of Asia Pacific Regional Perspective on Services. Uh, I have seven minutes or so to go through these slides, so I'll talk as quickly as I can. <laughs> but to achieve that goal, uh, I would like to answer two key questions. So first question is, did trade agreements help remove barriers in Japan and create opportunities, particularly for companies like AFLAC and the insurance business? And then the second question is to answer, is Japan ready uh, to conclude TPP and TISA? And on this point, I would like to discuss the strategic level preparedness, not the tactical level, uh, because I don't want to get into what happened last week uh, and interpret what happened last week for today's purpose. And I'll explain further when we get to that point. So first point uh, is that Maybe this is too small for you to see, but Japan is indeed a very important market for the insurance sector. It is the second largest uh, insurance market, life insurance market, in terms of uh, premium income, 16.21% of the global income. Uh, despite uh, already being the third largest economy, it was always a big insurance market uh, uh, in the past, and it is still today. Uh, and of course, in any uh, foreign uh, direct investment opportunity that companies will seek, it is the transparent and predictable regulatory practice, strong rule of law, and of course, fair and non-discriminatory market access. Those are the questions and e objectives that uh, companies would like to see uh, resolved. And, and it is in that context that in the 90s, important negotiations took place between the United States and Japan. First, a bilateral negotiating process, US-Japan insurance agreement, 
was concluded, the first one in 1994, and the second one in 1996, and then followed by the General Agreement on Trade and Services, GATS. Uh, I happen to be one of the negotiators uh, from USTR that participated in that. Uh, with that, I, I will give you a historical perspective by first uh, giving you the market share of the Japanese market in 1992, one year prior to USTR initiating the bilateral negotiating process. Foreign life insurers only had 2.3% of the market with domestic life insurers holding 97.7%. And the negotiations took place, and I'm happy to say today, well, the most latest data that we have, 2012, foreign life insurers uh, controlled 23.7% of the life insurance market. Uh, and of course, U.S.-Japan insurance agreement, GATS, uh, played a critical role, not the only factor. Uh, it goes, uh, it's important to note that Japan, of course, adopted domestic stru structural reform measures, financial big bang, and so on. But no question in my mind that the trade agreements made a big difference. So uh, I don't know where you are, Dick, uh, right there, Dick, Dick Self. Uh, thank you for all that you did in negotiating GATS back in, in the mid-90s. So with that in mind, uh, of course, talk, taking note of where American companies and European companies are, we are among the top 10 companies in Japan, the second largest uh, insurance market. Uh, Alico, uh, Midlife now acquired, uh, and AFLAC and uh, Prudential top three American companies there, and AXA, uh, of course, making inroads. So the, the simple answer is yes, indeed, trade agreements have made a big difference uh, for American and European companies. So the second question then is, is Japan ready, looking to the future, to conclude TPP and TISA? And on this point, again, I would like to talk about the strategic level preparedness, not tactical, uh, not get into, for example, what happened last week in terms of uh, uh, there's some uh, blame game going on on both sides, and I won't, I won't get into that. But uh, talk about whether Japan is ready, in, in my view. And of course, in talking about TPP and TISA, it is important to note uh, the importance of Japan, in my view. Uh, TPP country GDP and with and without Japan on the left and on the right, uh, definitely, of course, no question that economically meaningful, uh, commercially meaningful agreement certainly will result uh, if Japan is in it and not out of it uh, on TPP context and TISA context as well. Uh, services value uh, calculated using 2011 values, service exports uh, with uh, Japan and with J without Japan, uh, the services imports uh, with Japan, without Japan, uh, don't question that Japan is indeed an important service uh, country uh, in, in terms of uh, comp opportunities, opportunities for insurance company. The second point uh, to understand the context in un analyzing the preparedness of Japan is to note that Japan is indeed pursuing its own version of competitive liberalization and strategy. That uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership is the most uh, uh, focused uh, in negotiating process for Japan now. Uh, TPP will define how Japan engages in other negotiations. But Japan-EU negotiations, FTA, are ongoing, making important progress. Uh, so as uh, Japan-Canada EPA. And of course, ASEAN Plus 6 is a major initiative as well, and TISA being an important negotiating process. It is this trade policy that is being pursued, but also <coughs> in the context of what is called Abenomics, the three-arrow strategy uh, that is indeed uh, prom providing tremendous promise uh, and uh, for those of us certainly on the ground in Japan. That, of course, uh, it is important to have a prime minister who's in office longer than one year. Uh, <laughs> that is a good thing. Uh, prime Minister Abe clearly, clearly has solidified his position by taking control of the lower house and upper house. So he's going to be prime minister for a while. And he's pursuing, as you know, the three-hour strategy of bold monetary policy, fiscal uh, policy, and then the growth strategy. Uh, I won't go into the monetary policy and flexible fiscal policy side because of the time limitation, but the growth strategy uh, certainly requires a lot of discussion. And as we were getting ready for today's panel, one of the colleagues on the panel asked, 
we don't hear that there's real uh, uh, effort on the part of growth strategy structural reform. And I actually uh, believe that there is a tremendous effort underway. And trade policy <coughs> and trade agreements are part of that, of course, as well. Two examples to talk about the kind of progress that Japan is making, I believe. Uh, first is to talk about initiatives in financial capital markets reform. And taking these issues alone, there's of, co of course no silver bullet in any structural reform initiative of any country, but taking these items that have been part of the agenda before, but this time in a very different way, I think this administration, Abe administration, is showing a very high level of sophistication in achieving structural reform. First step is corporate uh, governance reform, enhancing independent outside board member participation, stewardship code, and so on. Uh, that's one thing. It's always important to force companies to be more efficient and so on uh, to do that. But secondly, if you don't measure it, of course, it's not going to be pushed. Uh, and therefore, the second element, Japan Exchange Group Nikkei Index is a new uh, index, 400 it index is a new index that came out that looks at return on equity, equity uh, more uh, as an important criteria and so on. And then finally, the Government Pension Investment Fund Reform, GPIF, 126.6 trillion yen, one of the largest pension funds in the world, now changing its portfolio to invest into equities. And all of these things together is going to tremendously uh, contribute to change in corporate behavior in Japan and promote the kind of investment opportunity that I believe that provides opportunities for mergers and acquisitions for companies as well. In the interest of time, I won't go through uh, further detail of this, but the one I think probably that receives a lot of attention on the part of trade policy experts, certainly in this town, is agriculture and mar market access as an impediment to concluding TPP. And this is where I would like to also uh, uh, congratulate uh, Abe administration for a tremendous work that they're doing. I won't go into the details here again also, but Gentan, for example, is one example. This is a comprehensive rice price maintenance and production uh, control mechanism that for the first time in uh, nearly half a century that they're terminating. The second is they're creating a farm bank to consolidate and expand the scale of farms, and that's, that's a very impress, impressive thing. But the most important point to make is the effort to reform Japan Agricultural Group. This is a co-op that organizes the farming group at the local and national level. It is exempted from the application of antitrust, and as a result, it can do all kinds of things in terms of co controlling production, as well as wholesale distribution and so on. And for the first time since 1955, the Ad Abe administration is pursuing tremendous reform and is timing the legislation to reform J uh, JA Group for uh, next diet session, which is coming in January, exactly the moment uh, following the midterm election and APEC heads of state, in November, December, opportunity to maybe close the TPP. And if the JA Group is not certainly supportive uh, of any of this, and it has not been supportive, uh, it has been the one that provide the marcher, uh, uh, protest marching, and so on. And that clearly uh, is, is, has been a challenge politically on the ground in Japan. But this JA reform legislative opportunity next year early certainly can be leveraged to uh, deal with potential opposition politically. So uh, to conclude my remarks, is Japan ready to conclude TPP and TISA? In my view, the answer is yes. And this is based on being a student of Japanese political economy uh, since 19, early 80s, uh, working as a legislative uh, intern in the Japanese diet in the, in, in the mid 80s and looking into uh, today uh, and what is being done. I do believe that the Prime Minister meant what he said when he said he's willing to act like a drill bit strong enough to break through the solid rock of vested interest. So with that very optimistic uh, view, you have to be an eternal optimist to work on Japan issues in many ways. But I am indeed optimistic today and look forward to our panel discussion later. Thank you. Well, thank you, Charles. I, uh, it, it's great to have an optimistic presentation. I must say, I, a few years ago <laughs> when I was in Turkey, I was struck by the terror that had clearly gone through the administration 
when the Koreans negotiated Corus and the EU Korea Free Trade Agreement. And they suddenly woke up, woke up and realized that their Korean competitors had duty-free access to the two largest markets in the world. And unless they ran very hard, they were going to miss the free trade bus. So an example of the way bilateral free trade agreements can actually um, encourage competitive liberalization. Asia Pacific, let's not forget the Pacific. We are honored to have with us this afternoon his Excellency um, Ambassador Valdez, the ambassador from Chile, who's going to give us a perspective from the other side of the Pacific. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, um, it is a pleasure to be here and see some old friends. Chile has been uh, interested in services and uh, trading services for some time now since our negotiation with Canada in the 90s, uh, we have stressed and underlined the, the importance that services had to us. Uh, we have, uh, the, the service sector accounts for 67% of our GDP. It provides 70% 70, 70 of our employment. Uh, it, be, it has become 60% of our um, foreign direct investment. Therefore, uh, services has always been also a very important part of our trade negotiations and uh, of our efforts to link the region with itself and also to follow our line of open reg regionalism, as we have called it, our um, will to uh, participate in globalization and uh, negotiate with, uh, in, insert our economy in the, in the big economies of the world, in the developed economies. We are at present uh, important provider of services in transport and logistic services. Our airlines and maritime services are important in the region and in the world. And we are becoming a very important also provider of mining services, uh, given our uh, characteristics. But engineering, architectural services, even video games are important in our economy today. This is the reason why we have become such a strong advocate of trade liberalization in trading services. Uh, we have signed 23 free trade agreements with 61 countries, and 16 of these free trade agreements have provisions devoted to uh, services. The most important, pro probably the most important uh, program of integration in which we are involved today is the Pacific Alliance. And obviously the Pacific Alliance has as one of its main purposes to increase, deepen, make more complex and richer our relationship with the Asian countries. Most of the countries of the Pacific area in Latin America have today China as their main trade partner. Japan has been a very important partner of Chile for a long time. And as I have already mentioned, we have signed trade agreements with most of the Asia economies, most particularly with China. We were the first country in South America to sign a trade agreement with, with China. The Pacific Alliance reunites Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. It was created in 2011. Uh, we want to become what we have called an area of deep economic integration and move gradually to, towards a free circulation of services good capitals and persons. We are not a political alliance. We are an economic and trade alliance. We understand that the integration of Latin America in political terms goes through other ways and we wouldn't like to have these other ways to get involved with our own economic insertion in the world and with our own economic alliances within the region. This is why we have stressed the idea that economic and trade integration is the projection we want to give to 
the Pacific Alliance, and dedication to the Asia-Pacific region is one of the, its most important strategic aims. We have seen the Pacific Alliance as an open and non-exclusive integration process. We understand that some other countries, and I will be di very direct in mentioning Brazil uh, or Uruguay, who belong to the Mercosur group, to which we are associated, by the way, and who are interested and have some of them expressed interest in joining our Pacific Alliance, can do so in those areas in which our political, our economic policies converge and in which we are not forced to change a course which we have defined as successful and important in our development as a result of uh, political considerations. The Pacific Alliance constitutes today the eighth largest economy, if we add the economies of those countries represents the seventh largest exporting entity worldwide. In Latin America and the Caribbean, this bloc represents 36% of the GDP and concentrates 50% of total trade. It attracts 41% of direct foreign investment. Our countries added come to 212 million people. And our GDP uh, per capita is an average of $10,000. We have been very active in this Pacific Alliance if we consider that it has been uh, living only two years or three years. We have had nine presidential summits, 12 ministerial meetings, and we have 16 rounds of negotiation of technical groups. One of the most important areas has been the negotiation of services inside this Pacific Alliance. As I have already said, we want to achieve a free movement of services and capital. And we have worked mainly in two main areas. First of all, we want to position ourselves as an attractive destination for investment and trade in services. And we want to increase investment flows to all our countries, but particularly from the Asia-Pacific region. This year, in January, we signed an additional protocol on trade. Why this additional protocol on trade? Because for Chile, and the same happens, as I will say later for the TPP, Chile had already signed trade agreements with Mexico, with Colombia, and with Peru. In fact, with Mexico, we had signed two trade agreements, and with Peru, the same. Therefore, what we needed was something additional to the trade agreements we had already signed. This additional protocol on trade wants to complement, enhance, update, and deepen our bilateral trade agreements. We have been working on cross-border trading services, providing similar provisions to those in the free trade agreements, but we have updated the standard of liberalization, cross-border supply, consumption, consumption abroad, and presence of natural persons are topics we have, um, we have worked on. We have established a regulatory framework which includes the disciplines of national treatment, most favored nations, market access, and no obligation of local presence. In addition, we are especially interested in specific rules for professional services among our countries. In matters of investment, the new chapter rules investment in goods and services, of course, and it contains important disciplines in investment and investor protection. We have included the chapter on telecommunications, which guarantees the access to public telecommunication and services, and additional gives operators from the Pacific Islands, Alliance countries uh, the possibility to provide telecommunication services in the region on free competition conditions. Maritime services is also included, uh, and we would like very much to include also air services within our uh, agreements. And finally, financial services have also been included in our service uh, negotiation, um, providing the normal type of disciplines and uh, provisions that in are included in uh, trade uh, negotiations 
of higher standards. We have, we face new challenges, of course, and uh, these new challenges have been faced by this technical working group on capital and services. I don't want to give you more information on this, but I want to underline the fact that the Pacific Alliance is extremely involved in developing a service sector between our countries and deepening the type of agreements we have already signed. Uh, we see ourselves as countries that can be extremely important in services in our relationship with the Asia-Pacific countries. And of course, given the characteristics of Chile, for instance, and uh, the fact that we have been able to develop an efficient and modern infrastructure, that we are opening two big tunnels with Argentina and all of our communications with Argentina are going to be highways in the next 20 years. We understand very well that Chile can be a country that can provide a bridge for not only the Pacific countries, but also for Brazil and Argentina vis-a-vis -vis trade with um, the Asian countries. Trading services in TPP. Chile participated in the origins of TPP. If I might say, it was in part one of the origins of TPP, given that the original was the famous P4, Brunei, Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore. Uh, we have participated by now in 22 rounds of negotiation at the TPP, and we have to say that we have trade agreements with all of the countries that are participating in the TPP at present. This, of course, has made difficult our selling of this agreement in Chile. Let me be frank. In Chile, people ask themselves, why on earth, if you already have agreements, trade agreements with all these countries, you are going to raise standards in some difficult areas like intellectual property and others, uh, simply to, be, to belong to a, to a movement you, already, you have already participated for the last in some cases, 10 years, we have signed an agreement with the, we signed an agreement with the United States 10 years ago. But we believe that uh, in some cases, we can make progress in free trade with the Asia-Pacific countries through the TPP. Let me mention, of course, Japan, which is the first case, first case and most important case. We need more access for goods to Japan. We have trade with Malaysia and Vietnam, which do not contain services, and therefore we would like to make progress on that. Therefore, we see the TPP as an opportunity to have a comprehensive trade agreement with all TPP partners, and we will continue to participate in this negotiation with enthusiasm, even if I, say, I had said we are also going to negotiate uh, the tougher we can in some areas, because it is a type of negotiation that creates complexities for a country in a developing process as Chile is. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, last but certainly not least, David Dollar from Brookings is going to talk to us about a country that's pretty important in Asia Pacific, China. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We can't really talk about services in the Asia Pacific without talking about China, second biggest economy in the world. In general, the service sectors are quite underdeveloped in China. So it's interesting for me to listen to the discussion of Chile and Japan. You know, gives me some perspective on just how different things are in China. That's slowly changing. Just in the last two years, the service sector is what we call the tertiary part of the economy, has risen up and surpassed industry in terms of share of GDP. So the tertiary sector is the largest share of GDP in China but just by a tiny amount, and that's only happened in the last two years. Now, as, as Sir Arthur said, once you reach middle income, it's normal for services to grow faster than GDP and increase their share of GDP. That should have started happening in China at least 10 years ago, but it didn't. You know, the share was stagnant, if not declining, until just the last two years. So you've really got seriously underdeveloped service sector, and you can think of that as tremendous opportunity for growth in, that, in those uh, sectors. Now, why is the service sector so underdeveloped? I think there are a number of factors. 
An important one is that China has been pursuing a very investment-intensive growth model. Investment in generally relies on the output of industry, so that's kind of a stimulus to industry. But I think another aspect of China's growth model is that it's relatively open in the manufacturing sectors, but it's actually quite closed in the service sectors. So manufacturing sectors in China tend to be very, very competitive, you know, and the cliche is that China is the factory of the world, and there's some truth in that. China's obviously been very successful at producing a wide range of manufactured products. But part of their strategy has been to keep protected service sectors dominated by state enterprises. So if you look in banking or insurance, uh, telecom, media, many important service sectors, you've got a small number of giant state enterprises dominating the sector and not a lot of opportunity for private firms to come in. That's true for domestic private firms, also for international firms. The OECD calculates a measure of restrictiveness of foreign investment for different countries. They do it for the whole economy and for specific sectors. According to the OECD, China is the most restrictive G20 country in terms of receptiveness to foreign investment. And then if you break it down, you find China is pretty open to manufacturing, but it's almost completely closed in financial services, media, telecom, transport, the internet, essentially the whole panoply of modern services. So we start out you know, with relatively closed, uh, unproductive service sectors in China. So that, I think that kind of initial situation is, has a lot of negativity, but also the, the, the hint of some potential. Now the good news is that China's leaders seem to understand uh, this situation and want to change it. So at the important third plenum of the Communist Party leadership, uh, just about exactly a year ago now, you know, they came out with a broad blueprint for reform and it contained some very nice languages, very nice language about services. Let me just read you one nice sentence from the Communist Party resolution. We will promote the orderly opening up of finance, education, culture, healthcare, and other service sectors lift limits on access for foreign investment in child care, care for the elderly, architectural design, accounting and auditing, trade and logistics, electronic commerce, and other such service sectors. So you know, many of us were quite encouraged by the resolution that came out of the third plenum because it, it contained a lot of ideas for reform, including the, the uh, uh, aspect I just read you. So that's pretty ambitious. But it's also a pretty general statement without timetable or a lot of details. So if you want to look more in the aspect of details, what you've got coming out of China in the last couple years, number of positive indications. Uh, China has expressed an interest in joining the TISA negotiations. The US and China have agreed to negotiate a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, China started this Shanghai free trade zone as an experimental area to move ahead more quickly with reform. So, number of positive initiatives. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of action in the last year or the last two years. You know, let me just say a word about each of these initiatives. The, Frank, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone has sort of sounded nice when it was announced, but it's kind of a strange idea. What China needs now is to open up service sectors I just mentioned. It needs financial liberalization, more exchange rate flexibility. These are inherently national level policies. So you can't really take a one little zone in Shanghai and liberalize the exchange rate or open up financial services. If you can invest in that zone and serve the whole country, well then you're opening up the whole country, which would be revolutionary. If you can invest in that zone and serve that zone, 28 square miles, you know, frankly that, that's not much of an innovation. And I think as a result, because of some problem in the concept, uh, there really hasn't been much uh, progress with that Shanghai zone. The TISA, that was just a general statement on China's part that it would like to be involved, but all of the 23 countries negotiating TISA uh, would have to agree to let China into that discussion. So of those initiatives, the one I see as the most serious is the bilateral investment treaty between China and the US, because the two sides are actually negotiating and have had quite a few series of meetings this year. So it's encouraging that China is pursuing that because that would require China to open up all of its sectors to foreign investment, to mergers and acquisitions, actually would require China to open the capital account as well. 
with the exception of a negative list, but there's no hope of really of the U.S. agreeing to any negative list that, that's particularly long. Where we stand at the moment is we're waiting for China to come back with a proposed negative list to negotiate over. And I think that's really going to be a critical moment when we find out how serious China is. Do they come back with a small list of negative, small negative list of sectors that would remain closed? Uh, or do they come with a list of 100 or more sectors, uh, in which case there's really not much prospect? So I'm being frank, I think the situation is somewhat confusing in that it's encouraging that China's making these initiatives, but there's not a lot of action in terms of real opening up. And there does seem to be opposition from the incumbent firms and from local government. Uh, so I think it's, you know, it's quite uncertain whether or not China is really going to move aggressively opening up these service sectors. The last thing I'll say is that th this would be quite important for them. Their growth rate is slowing down because that investment heavy model has really run out of steam. So they need new areas of dynamism. They new, need new areas for investment. You know, in services will be the leading sector of the economy going into the future. So opening up to private investment, foreign trade, foreign investment, all that makes a lot of sense. I was glad to hear Charles' optimism because China is clearly watching the TPP negotiations. They're watching what Korea does, what Japan does. And it's more likely that China will want to be involved if it feels that these are successful initiatives that are moving along. But I think right now, it, it kind of hangs in the balance how aggressively China pur pursues this services liberalization. Well, thank you, David. Let me just supplement one point. You, you, you focused on the US-China investment uh, agreement. Uh, don't forget, there are parallel discussions going on between the EU and uh, China, and I, I suspect USTR are talking to the Commission to make sure that our respective policies are aligned. I sincerely hope they are. Just to sort of quickly, briefly round off the picture, we haven't had much time uh, to talk about India. Ed touched on equity caps in uh, the mm -hmm. insurance. Uh, it's deeply depressing that, of course, that the first major trade policy decision of the, the new Modi government was the, uh, um, the vetoing of the trade facilitation agreement. I can only tell you Americans that we in Europe have been trying to negotiate an EU-India free trade agreement mm, seven years now we've been at it and we're still waiting for the first tabling of the first services offer from the Indian side. So I don't want you to get carried away by this optimism from Charles and the ambassador. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a very mixed picture in Asia. But we have now precisely 13 minutes left according to my clock and we are anxious to open it up regulated by, uh, uh, by the local Chinese regulators. You can have 100% of the equity, but essentially it had to be a separate Chinese bank. When the Chinese banks started to come to London in the last few years, they wanted to come in as branches. And they were deeply shocked when the Bank of England said, well, we're not sure about this. We think you should be separately capitalized um, subsidiaries in London, and um, Chinese were, you know, dreadfully upset by this uh, notion. But of course, it was an exact um, uh, op uh, parallel with the way that they had treated foreign banks. I suspect that Chinese attitudes towards the treatment of incoming banks is beginning to change as a result of the treatment that their banks are getting now as they expand overseas. So you're, you're absolutely right. The more China invests overseas, the more it faces the same sort of regulatory barriers that Ed was talking about, as they will, mm -hmm. the more interested they're going to become in uh, li genuine liberalization. Another question, please. No more questions. I don't believe it. The fastest no. growing region in the world. <laughs> this is the future of all your companies <laughs> in this part of the world. Um, gentleman over there. Thanks very much. Um, I, uh, I have a question for Charles Lake. Um, I'm very interested in your assessment that Japan is ready to, uh, to conclude a TPP. Um, so what's holding it up? Um, and um, what is, you know, the, the, the focus is always on Japan. When is Japan 
move on the five sacreds or whatever? Uh, when is Japan going to move on autos? What does Japan want from us? What do we have to give? Is there anything that we need to do? And uh, I guess there's more to that question, but uh, maybe that's enough right now. Uh, what, what's it going to take? What is the tripping point? What is the, is it TPA? Is, is that the moment uh, at which Japan will be truly ready? Um, there are those who feel that uh, Japan simply won't until they have TPA, until we have TPA, and they stand much less of a chance of having to go back and renegotiate. So I guess that's three questions. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. What a wonderful question, uh, and it, I'm glad that we only have three more minutes to answer this because <laughs> that gives me less amount of time to get into trouble. Uh, but I, I do believe that uh, there will be an argument against this from the U.S. side, but let me communicate to you what I hear from uh, people in the Prime Minister's office, uh, business leaders in Tokyo. Uh, I'm based in Japan. Uh, now I've been there now 15 years. And it is... TPA is indeed an issue. Uh, it is not just a talking point uh, because ultimately the prime minister and his team has to deal with the political reality of those who are opposed to it. As I mentioned in my presentation, leverage and, and measures have been prepared to deal with that, uh, but nevertheless it is going to be challenging. So when the time comes to have that final negotiating package put together, to achieve that comprehensive high standard uh, agreement, uh, they need to understand that the deal is going to be the deal. And TPA is a component of it, but I'm not sure it has to be passed before an agreement uh, can be reached, that a heads of state engagement uh, in making the political deal with certain commitments post uh, midterm election uh, is potentially doable. Uh, and I think that uh, doing a lot of kabuki up to that point and putting it together, I do believe is indeed possible. And so ultimately, I, I have total confidence in Ambassador Foreman's ability to work it out with Minister Ahmadi, <coughs> and I'm sure there will be uh, a lot of kabuki prior to that. Uh, but uh, the important point is, unlike many other negotiations that Japan has been part of, this time, the domestic package has been put in place, in my view, in a way that uh, brings this together. Now, is it going to be 99 percentage coverage, 98 uh, tariff? I'm not the negotiator. I, I'm not in the room. Hopefully, it's something that both sides indeed believe is a high standard. Uh, it is uh, one minute uh, remaining, but I, I've said enough beyond it. I see my government affairs team looking at me very seriously. So <laughs> I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Charles. Well, I must say this has been, a, a, I, I think, a wonderful it's panel. I mean, you know, led by Ambassador Valdez. I mean, the example that Chile has set to the rest of us. I mean, Chile puts the United States and Europe to shame in terms of uh, the removal of barriers to services. Um, when you think about you know, how in the United States they've still got these 19th century cabotage rules on air services and maritime services, and so on and so on. I won't start. Um, but it's, it, this, is, uh, this has been a re very refreshing um, uh, panel. Room for optimism, some room for caution from Ed. Cool realism. Pragma <laughs> pragmatic view from Cold David. Let, join me, please, in thanking them all. <laughs> <laughs>